afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Emergency Manuals Implementation Collaborative Webinar. I am Kurt Lowry, a project manager at Ariadne Labs, working closely with the surgery team here, and I'll be your co-host for this event. Thank you all for joining us today from all around the world. Uh, due to the size and nature of this discussion, participants will be muted uh, with video off upon entry. If you would like to ask any questions during the presentation or discussion, please utilize the chat at the uh, right-hand side of everybody's screen and uh, send your question to everybody, and we will try to get as many questions as possible. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and would will be posted to our EMIC archive once available. It is my pleasure to introduce you to uh, my co-host, Dr. Alex Hanenberg, who will be leading the webinar discussion and introducing our main presenters today. Alex is a faculty member in the Safe Surgery Program here at Ariadne Labs and a past president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. His work is focused on the implementation of crisis checklists for critical event management in the operating room and beyond. In these roles, and in collaboration with the Stanford Anesthesia Cognitive Aid Group and others, he helped co-found the Emergency Manual Implementation Collaborative, also known as EMIC, a, nat a nationwide group of representatives from hospitals devoted to bringing emergency tools and cognitive aids into our OR. Alex, take it away. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Kurt, and thanks to you and Jim for managing the technology so uh, so ably. I'm glad that so many people could uh, join us this afternoon, especially recognizing the incredible clinical demands that uh, many of you face, uh, considering the amazing things that healthcare professionals have done in the past several uh, several months. It's easy to be proud to count you uh, as colleagues. Now, when we think about cognitive aids in healthcare and in aviation and other fields too, we usually bifurcate a little bit between aids for routine events and those for non-routine events. The WHO safe surgery checklist and the crisis checklist are examples of each. And obviously, they have an awful lot in common, but perhaps especially with respect to tra training and implementation, some important differences exist. It strikes me that COVID has highlighted a gray area in which the routine has become non-routine. Uh, getting dressed and undressed, intubating and extubating have become complex, stressful, and high-risk activities. That's the way we characterize treating a rare and critical event like an air embolism, and the way we understand the special need for cognitive aids to make care more complete and reliable under these conditions. The group at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, Australia, quickly responded to this need with a set of COVID-related procedural checklists. To be sure, they are not the only group to create such tools. The WFSA, Lifebox, and Smile Train collaboration comes to mind. It's not really surprising that a group of three well-established global nonprofits could develop this material. But for me, it is just a bit amazing that this single department could act so quickly and expertly uh, to meet this need. So with this in mind, we really have two threads for today's conversation, the content design and use of these COVID tools themselves, but also the foundation that allowed this group to act so nimbly in the face of an unprecedented global health crisis. So without further ado, let me welcome our three colleagues from Sydney to the webinar. We're pleased to have Dr. Ben Olesnicki, Department Chair, and Drs. Jesse Mulder and Dan Zalouf, Anesthesia Fellows at Royal North Shore Hospital with us today. They have been the core group in developing uh, these COVID checklists. Uh, they'll provide some background with their, uh, on their experience with cognitive aids uh, and go into some detail about the uh, development of the COVID tools. And I'll have the 
pleasure of being able to probe a little bit on some of the details on both those threads. So, and particular thanks to them for getting up so early on the other, uh, on the other side of the world uh, to meet a, <laughs> as much of a mutually convenient timetable as we could uh, construct. I think they've asked Ben to kick us off with an overview of who they are and when they, where they work. So Ben. Morning, Alex. Morning, everybody, or afternoon, evening, where you are. Uh, let me just spread, let me just share a couple of slides we've got for you. Um, so I'll just give you a bit of an overview of, of who we are at Royal North Shore over here in Sydney. Um, the next slide was, was meant to be a nice little video that, that flies 15,000 kilometres over from, from North America across the Pacific Ocean and then flies into Sydney, but unfortunately on this computer it's not working. <laughs> But it ends up with a, a picture of Sydney, which shows the, the bridge and the opera house and the harbour, which splits our city into two. And Royal North Shore sits about a kilometre north of the harbour up on a hill. Now, when I tell people that, they all think this is the view we're getting from our, uh, from our hospital and our operating theatres, which would be a very nice view on a nice Sydney day there. But uh, this is the actual view we get from our hospital operating theatres out the back. Um, but if you look very closely over there, you can see the Harbour Bridge. So we do actually have bridge views from our hospital, which is very nice. At least we did until about two months ago. And there's another building that's been built exactly in front of that arrow, unfortunately. So this is our hospital. We've moved into this hospital about uh, eight years ago. Uh, in terms of the size of the hospital, it's around about 710 beds, depending on how you measure beds. Uh, and on the same campus, it's co-located with a big private hospital, which has about another 400 beds. So between the two, there's about 1,100 beds and uh, the, probably about 40 operating theatres, depending on how you uh, define those as well. Um, so it's quite big. It's, uh, there's a, a big co-located sim centre around the back on that, on the, you can see on the top left of that picture, the, uh, the orange chimney, I don't know if you can see there. That's the clinical, the Colling building our research building, which has a big uh, simulation centre in there. Um, and then there's a big sort of world-renowned pain clinic just behind where you'd be sitting if you were looking at the hospital from here. Um, the, our health service is public and private. Public is uh, provided to everyone free of charge, which is what this hospital is, and private is you have insurance. In the public hospital, uh, especially in ours, it's a very high emergency load. Um, so about 50% of what we do is emergency cases, whereas the private is a very strong elective bent. And then the other thing to say about our hospitals is we, we do have university affiliations, but they're very loose and it just means we train up those specific medical schools at our hospitals. The, the, the academia is not as, as, as tightly woven as, as I think you get a lot of the times at the big teaching hospitals in America. So, so we're much more clinical than academic here. The, the benefit of having the simulation centre there, I have to say, is a lot of the anaesthetists or anaesthesiologists from the simulation centre work in our department. We have a department of about 90 consultant or attending anaesthetists and about uh, 30 trainees. Um, and because we have because we've always had those simulation uh, experts within our department, we've, we've always been involved in teaching simulation human factors, which has sort of piqued our personal interest in, in cognitive aids. Um, and, and that's where we come from. That's our hospital. Um, okay, and then I think I'm just gonna, hi everyone, my name's Dan. Um, I'm one of the uh, fellows here. I'm just gonna sort of talk to you a bit about our journey um, from sort of creation just briefly for sort of five to seven minutes. Um, and I think sort of broadly speaking, our journey will, will probably sound a bit familiar to many of you because I think um, these sort of, uh, I think enthusiasts are drawn to this area very much when you reach a point in your career, when you start to realize that it's both impossible nor desirable to hold everything um, in the forefront of your memory. We've got to start relying on technologies and tools to, to optimize and uh, 
of optimize our performance and, and also augment patient safety. Um, I think Ben admitted actually, if we just go on to the next slide, Ben, one of his earlier memories when we were discussing our origins was this um, cognitive aid here up on, on the left of your screen called a swift check. I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with it, but um, Ben recalls it being heavily plastered on virtually every anesthetic machine in our department before my time um, and also remembers having to commit it to memory as well, which is interesting because I think in many respects defeats the purpose potentially. Um, but I think we, you know, we have progressed a long way since then, although certainly it's worth recognizing the roots of cognitive aids in our, in our department. The picture on the right um, is actually where, for me, the journey started. Um, I was sitting in uh, our neuro theatre. This is uh, Dr. David Pickford, one of our chief neuroanesthetists here. And we were just going through various materials uh, together and I was picking his brains. And talking about crises, we were just really reminded of this big gap between work as done and work as imagined. Um, and, you know, the, the great example that, that I always recall was sort of looking at resources on the intraoperative cerebral aneurysm rupture, which always seemed to stress massive transfusion as a, as a key part of the response. And then you spoke to David and you realized that, you know, in his decades of experience, this was just so, so seldom required. Um, and so we started to think about cognitive aids in our line of work. And we essentially ended up going onto Google and, and, and looking up um, what was out there and that's when we came across a very sort of more prominent established community of cognitive aid enthusiasts um, in the US and I've, I've noticed that um, Sarah Gold have a fiber is on so a bit of a shout out to her and uh, Dr. David Gabba both of us both of them sorry made us feel very welcome and, and embraced despite being very new players to this space um, and they, they're the ones that actually pointed us here um, so it is a real privilege to be able to talk to you all but I think it was in, that, in those early weeks and months that the notion of buy-in and, and ownership were really impressed upon us. Um, and so when we started to look at our department, um, we would naturally think about the subspecialists in our department and uh, the various specialty areas. Um, but the corollary of that, I guess, is that not everyone can be a specialist in everything. Uh, and coincidentally, it was around that time that there ended up being a real calling out and a real need identified for support tools, um, particularly in neuroanesthesia, where a lot of us are called to be, you know, occasional neuroanesthetists, especially out of hours. We do a lot of big, um, juicy sort of neurovascular procedures too. Um, and so there was something there that, that we felt we could probably um, sort of dive into. Uh, and that's when we decided to, to focus uh, on creating an interest group and then our first question naturally was, you know, what was going to work in our center and with our culture? Um, and so if we just go on to the next page, uh, the next slide, um, you know, we identified a few different issues um, with look, when we looked at various resources. And I guess, again, this is with, with a view of how, how do we get by in a, at our place? Um, so as Ben alluded to, we are, a, you know, a jobbing anesthetic department in that, you know, we all have a very strong clinical component to our to our practice, slightly less academic uh, one, and so we knew we really needed to reflect work has done as much as as much as possible, and really have very authentic workflows uh, and reflect very much what can be done, and I think it's that pragmatism which you know on reflection and has certainly been fed back to us, which has given us a broad sense of appeal. Um, and then there were other issues, you know, uh, I think we'll, we'll touch on it later on and we can certainly leave it to the Q&A, but we didn't feel that the, the pure checklist was going to really excite or stick in our department. And then there's issues of pitch and visual design. So I'll just sort of briefly talk about these very, very momentarily. But essentially, I think pitch is the elephant in the room when it comes to comparing and contrasting different styles, um, because uh, we very deliberately decided to focus on the level or two below expert. So these were, we were primarily aiming our resources at very senior clinicians who had lots of experience. And we wanted to just sort of give them pointers by way of goals rather than getting them too focused on, you know, processes and the minutiae of various interventions, some of which may be less familiar to them. And this was deliberate because we wanted their intuition and experience, which ultimately you know, they've spent their whole careers amassing and ultimately are being paid for as well um, to, to come to the fore. Um, 
I'm not going to touch too much on design. I think we could talk about this ad infinitum, but uh, needless to say, we, we've got in-house visual design expertise and we were very much um, inspired by using many of the foundational design lessons that we encounter every day, even driving around. Um, so if we just go over to the next slide, one of the cognitive aids I felt we could not omit from you know, a brief introduction was the vortex dealing with the unanticipated difficult airway co-developed by another Australian anaesthetist down in Victoria called uh, Nick Crimes. Um, and we were really drawn to this in our initial sort of foray into this whole uh, sphere of cognitive aids. Um, what we, and you'll probably see it's a far cry, I guess, from many of the other mental models which you may associate with, with the difficult airway, but we were drawn to it because of its simplicity. Um, it seemed to sort of account for the limits of working memory, or at least the theory behind those limits. Um, it had this sort of layered pitch in that um, it sort of presented the operator with three or four key lifelines, but when you looked into it all, each lifeline could sort of shroom out into a whole repertoire of additional detail. It used symbology that was attractive to us because it made the cognitive aid accessible. Um, and it had a very evocative, or it still does, I think in many of our minds, a, an evocative design. Um, and so we decided to sort of focus on creating an identity. If we just go over to the next slide, then thanks. And, and I, I think our identity we see very much as being a bridge between two poles. On the one hand, uh, a group of very excited, motivated, but also very knowledgeable content experts in an area. So our, our, first, our first project was, was cognitive aid for neuroanesthesia. In that case, it was the, the neuroanesthetist in the department. Uh, and we're very much a bridge between them and the human factors simulation experts that we're lucky to have who really have known about the potential for cognitive aids for, for a very long time. Um, so I put here, you know, strong design unifies. Um, the reality is much more nuanced than that. Um, I think that a group of end users driving uh, this, this ship um, as, as our little group are and sort of allows um, a, a bit of a mediation with that inherent tension um, that exists. Um, and I've just put on the next slide as well. Um, this is just an example of how, you know, those various domains come together to create this sort of magic and every sort of detail is a bit of a compromise between all three groups. The picture, the photograph on the top right is, um, and it shows, I think, uh, one of our cognitive aid uh, being used actually in situ in our neuroanesthesia um, theater. And our, our slogan, I think, really epitomizes us. We're very much about people, practice and performance. We're about people in that we try and do our best to try and create functional teams. Um, we're about practice, about plugging the knowledge gaps that exist and um, optimize clinical decision-making uh, we're also about performance. We're about bringing an awareness of the uh, biases, the fatigue, the stresses that occur at the cold face and try and cater towards that. So um, I know you're keen to talk about COVID and I think we'll get onto it now, but hopefully that just provides you with a bit of context of how we got to where we were back in um, February of this year. Are you, uh, are you going to address COVID? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we can. Uh, did you want to ask okay. any questions about it or we'll just continue on? Um, well, I, I think uh, if you can just uh, explain to the group uh, the domains of COVID clinical care that you've addressed with uh, checklists, I think that would be uh, a great way to set up the further discussion. Sure. Um, so, in terms of, of COVID, there's a, there's a, we want to make a, a, a difference between a checklist and what we're developing as cognitive aids. And I think Alex, you touched on that in your introduction that what we're doing is, is not routine. A checklist ticks off routine things. So for instance, machine check, tick, um, bag mask, tick, emergency drugs drawn up, tick. Whereas what we're developing is, is more looking at cognitive aids, which is, distilling out the difference in certain situations, the, the important differences between that and your routine best practice. Um, so rather than using checklist experience, where 
we need to make a, a dis, uh, we need to change that to say that these are cognitive aids and they're not checklists and they're not meant to be there to, to tick off every everything that you'd normally do with normal practice. It's about distilling the difference. And so when we look at COVID, we need to look at what is different to our normal practice and therefore what did we need to develop these cognitive aids for. Um, and so when we thought about it, a lot of things are different, but but definitely the for, for anesthesiologists or anaesthetists, we, we talk about the, the different processes that need to go into intubating patients, extubating patients, transport around the hospital, um, and then specific areas within our hospital, such as obstetrics, which is in a separate sort of uh, building, separate area. And our, uh, we have a big allergy clinic here that does a lot of, of perioperative allergy stuff. Um, and so we needed to look at all of those and, and what is different and then develop these cognitive aids for those. Right, I mean, one of the um, uh, things that uh, uh, strikes me as a particular ch uh, challenge and difference also in developing cognitive aids for the care of COVID is uh, that there uh, by and large are no published uh, practice uh, guidelines or consensus statements uh, and the kinds of resources that many of us developing cognitive aids uh, for uh, critical events uh, have sought and rely, relied on. This is uh, mostly uncharted territory with a uh, limited and evolving evidence base. Uh, how, uh, how did you uh, cope with that particular challenge of working in COVID care? Yeah, I, I guess to, to set the scene in Australia, touch wood, we've been quite uh, untouched by COVID, although at the moment there's one of our states has a little outbreak of, of, of COVID. However, like everyone, we watched the initial reports in sort of early year from Wuhan and and then that seemed to disappear and, and no one was speaking about it. And then the north of Italy blew up and it was all over our news and papers and, and spoken about a lot within our hospital. And we started getting a few cases of COVID and then looking back at what had happened in Italy, we had this time pressure to suddenly develop all of these uh, cognitive aids and, and change our practice. And that's a physical change of practice. We had to change some theatres to negative pressure. We had to clear out rooms to have anti-rooms and, and, and also change in practice in, in what we're going to do. And so when, you, when we looked at it, it looked like we had two or three weeks to do all of this, to change all of the, the physical space, to change our practice and what we do, and to train everybody up in theatres at doing it. And when we're training people up in theatres, we're not just talking about uh, anesthesiologists, we're talking about it, it changes everybody, the surgeons, the surgical assistants, our anaesthetic nurses, the orderlies, the radiologists, what we're going to do with these patients. Because this shift occurred with everyone's psyche from, we have to protect healthcare workers now, which is the most important thing from getting this disease. So we were, we were challenged with, you've probably got a two or three week, um, two or three week buffer here to get all of this done and change all its practice and educate anyone, everyone on this practice. So then you start looking at, well, what's around and there's nothing published because this is an, an unheard of event that, that nobody's uh, provided for. There was a little bit of published data about the SARS outbreak that we relied on and what they were doing, especially in Singapore. There was a great article. Um, but there was a lot of anxiety amongst the staff that had to be managed as well, which this went towards. Now I have to say, um, I took up the uh, director or head of department job or chair of anesthesiology job about four months before this all happened, not knowing this was coming. So the previous chair is very, very happy that I decided to do this and, uh, and I've learned to <laughs> learn on my feet very quickly. But this is what we're used to, to providing. So this is, these are guidelines about management of the COVID patients in theatre. This is half of it. So if you can imagine trying to use that to teach somebody or to refer to it when they're, when they're doing this case for the first time, it's incredibly wordy and difficult to get to. You know, you're talking about number of air changes in the theatre and all sorts of things. 
but, but this outlines every step and goes into a bit more detail. But we had to distill that down to the important things. Um, and so these are the, the sort of things we came up with, what modifications you have, and then these are just two of ours, an extubation process. So it's something that you can refer to, you can learn, to, um, you can teach from, and it's useful for the frontline clinician that, that's actually doing the, the process. So these were developed, they were um, all uh, put up on the walls of the, the COVID theatres that we've got, the two COVID theatres, so that preoperatively you could refer to them as you're waiting for the patient, just to jog your memory after doing training sessions. Intraoperatively, you could, you've got nothing else to do in the COVID theatre because you can't take anything in there. Um, so you could read them up on the walls and then post-operatively, you can refer to them while we're, we're all doing a debrief after, after we do this. Um, that's what we chose to develop and, and, and do it. And I'm sitting here because of these two people next to me who did this in a very, very rapid uh, amount of time and, and came up with something which initially and, and going forward is not perfect. But the nature of this is it, it, it evolved along the way into things that are, are getting more and more useful and now seem to be out there with, with lots of people looking at them. Right, that, you, that raises a great point. Uh, so from what you've said and from our prior conversations, uh, the cognitive aids uh, are meant to reflect policy that was developed for your practice, for lack of a better word, on the basis of the best available evidence and, clinic, uh, and clinical judgment. So that it kind of highlights the difference between a cognitive aid for a particular variety of cardiac arrest that's uh, based on a similar distillation and effective presentation of American Heart Association uh, uh, guidelines. So we, you men mentioned that others have been interested in, in it. One of the reasons we look to reflect published practice guidelines is to establish the credibility and dependability of the material we're putting out in our cognitive aids. How has that worked in the case of cognitive aids that aren't based on published practice guidelines with respect to their uptake outside of Royal North Shore Hospital? Um, outside of Royal North Shore. If, if we talk about how it differs from, from the previous work, I might ask Jess to talk about that in terms of differing from prior work where there's established guidelines that we're basing this on. Um. Yeah, so it's slightly, I and mean, we can, I can address your question, um, Alex, but just in terms of actually creating them when there aren't a lot of evidence-based guidelines available. So we really relied on expert opinion and the, and the information that was coming through the, you know, scientific bodies within Australia and then through that filtering down to our local health district and Ben and the team at our hospital working with the infection control group and different, you know, expert subgroups, so the anaesthetic group, surgical team, the intensive care group when looking at the cardiac arrest component. So it, we just were relying on expert opinion and their development of guidelines for our particular health district. Um, so the content was provided, and as Ben has already uh, outlined, they really it became clear that we needed um, resources outside of just airway management. The sense of urgency was very different to what we'd experienced previously in working with the neuro manual. You know, it was developed over several months, whereas as Ben mentioned, we had you know a few weeks in our first cognitive aid we had a weekend to make you know that reflected so the safe airway society put out um, a nationwide guideline on airway management that was published in an australian medical journal that sort of became the foundation of in australia um, accepted expert opinion um, guidelines on management of airway and it was a multidisciplinary group sort of emergency physicians intensive care and, and anesthesia so that based the foundation of some of our 
um, cognitive aids and the training of our anaesthetists. But this kind of sense of urgency, I want to shout out to two of our other really key team members, Dan Moy and Dush Ayer. And within this period, we were communicating, you know, many times a day and the cycle of editing and reviewing and re-releasing sometimes happened more, more than once in a 24 hour period. Um, We've already spoken about the motivation of the clinician. So this real drive for people to learn this and upskill to um, protect their personal as well as the patient safety. And I think this meant along with the people already being familiar with the cognitive aids in our department that had been released previously and people had found useful um, that people were already open to the idea of using these and were actually very much, uh, very receptive to their use and, and saw the benefit. Um, it was very, we were working with a much broader group of stakeholders than we had previously. We previously only worked within the target audience being anaesthetists. Whereas now we had, we were developing cognitive aids that were being used uh, with the whole operating theatre team, so surgeons, scrub staff, orderlies, but also outside of the operating theatre um, for the cognitive aid for cardiac arrest in the COVID patient, we had to think about the language that was being used, making sure that ward doctors that may be quite junior were able to, um, you know, that was universally, you know, understandable, the language, you know, it wasn't as anaesthetic specific. So that was that was very different. And then, as you your listeners probably experienced, the policies changed. So it wasn't something that's been set in stone for ten years, and people have reflected on. And and it you know changes very infrequently over you know few year period. Whereas we had situations where sometimes each week we would have new information. For example, within the obstetric group or there'd be a major policy change that would change the entire design of a cognitive aid and the video that accompanied it. So we'd have to go back and redesign, for example, with cardiac um, arrest and CPR, whether or not that's considered an aerosol generating procedure it was quite controversial, went one way and the other way. And that, you know, then caught, basically means you have to go back to the drawing board. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a very different experience. And, and I think that because of the lack of um, established guidelines, when somebody does put something out like the Safe Airway Society, people are desperate to have guidance on what to do. And then it becomes something that is shared um, on social media, shared between different departments. So within Sydney, some of our um, clinicians that work, and ethicists that work in our hospital work at other anaesthetic departments. So the cognitive aids that we developed started to be shared amongst other anaesthetic departments because we had come up with some something, you know, which is, I guess, better than nothing in these situations. Yeah. <laughs> right. Des desperation opens the uh, mind. Uh, but you made a couple of uh, interesting points there. One was that in your institution, there was a culture that was very accepting and supportive of using cognitive aids. And as many of the people on uh, the webinar understand, that isn't necessarily the starting point of most people introducing cognitive aids. The other point I wanted to uh, touch, uh, touch on is the fact that you've posted these on your website and we mirror them actually on the emergencymanuals.org uh, page. Uh, so there is uh, uh, a high level of interest in help in managing a completely unknown uh, clinical entity. And I think we'd all anticipate significant up, uptake, but they're developed for use at Royal North Shore, number one. And number two, a lot of the underlying uh, principles of care are in constant flux. So my question is, how, what's your view of acceptable modification of the cognitive aids that, you're, that you've developed and what have what has been the practice of other institutions that have picked up your work from your website or ours? Yeah, I, th I think if we, that's just some of our cognitive aids. So if we're talking about using these in other facilities, I think 
partly Alex and, and how that's gone about. And I have to say, the, the big thing about this is it's very dynamic and, and it was done on first principles initially. And as Jess said, people were, were screaming out for, for AIDS for their own hospital. So it naturally got taken up, especially around Sydney and, and around Australia when they, they got published in the Medical Journal of Australia. And then that sort of linked to our side about our other AIDS. Um, there are certain things that are universal in this um, and there are certain things that are local uh, at a local level in terms of putting it up. So the, the, the guys will talk about this more in a minute about making these adaptable in the middle of, in the middle of everything going on. Uh, we, the discussion was how can people adapt this for their local uh, environment? And so they had to then change the cognitive aids to make it available, but adaptable for your local environment. So whereas what PPE is recommended for us, and I bring up PPE because that is the most emotional component of this and what everyone wanted to know, you know, at two in the morning, someone would ring up with a clinical question about which particular mask they should be using for this, for this thing. But, but if we talk about what, what sort of PPE you should use, that's even a very local, um, event because uh, when this all started in Sydney, um, our local health district was the epicenter within Sydney. So we had a few hundred cases come in, but they're all coming into our area. So our hospital became um, uh, what we called amber. So we set up a traffic light system, which was red, orange and green to manage with this. And if we're on green, it's essentially business as usual. You're screening people for COVID. When they come in and they, they're positive, then you do everything COVID. Otherwise you're doing what you'd normally do. Well, then we went to Amber where what you normally do has to change. So we all upped our PPE. We're all wearing N95s for, for aerosol generating procedures. And that was different in our hospital to the hospital across the four, five kilometers away or the hospital across the harbor because of our, the local uh, level of COVID within our community. So we tried to adapt that for other um, hospitals by having this traffic light system that every specific hospital could say they were on red, orange or green, and then what that meant for that specific hospital. Um, and a lot of that was, was dealt around PPE guidance for those particular hospitals. Um, and that also had the benefit of if you had changed everything while you're on green and, and educated everyone about this is what you do, if the, the incidents in your local community went up, you had to re-educate everybody about, no, now this is what you do. And there was already anxiety there. But by having a, a model that was taught that could dynamically respond to local conditions, it was a lot easier for re-teaching. It's just the simple, now we're on orange or now we're on red. And people understood, well, that meant we were changing. And it showed that there's, there was a dynamic event happening within COVID that you would be changing. So we'd be going orange, green, orange, green. A couple of hospitals in Sydney are now on orange and we're back on green. And it would have been very different to, to not have that aid there to tell people how this was changing and what they had to do. Um, the, uh, up on this slide on the right, in terms of what useful for your institution versus other institutions. So this is from our neurocognitive aids and it was, it's partly developed for COVID as well. Is it, the, the, there's a front and a back, and some of the front bits are very much what you use within your institution, and then the back bits are more uh, generalizable. Um, these are the principles behind it. So it's not necessarily uh, specific for that institution. And um, so the aids are, are tried to develop in terms of local guidelines and generalizability. And then I think the guys can talk about making them adaptable mm. and, and the principles behind that. Right, so I just, before they do it, I'm eager to hear, hear that with respect to building uh, the aid around uh, different uh, status levels, the, uh, the color-coded status of the institution, that sounds like it is a strategy to avoid repetitive and on-the-fly adjustments depending on changes. But I think what we're about to hear about is um, the uh, 
inevitable uh, necessity of a local institution for their peculiar circumstances to make some modifications. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I will also say that the red, orange and green has been taken up by our sort of state health for everything that they do. Um, this red, orange and green. Um, and it, it made it a bit difficult when a week ago, the, the Minister for Health, so the politicians announced that we're on amber uh, because they wanted everyone to wear masks in the community. And that <laughs> completely threw everybody out because everybody thought each particular hospital had to move to amber and then we had to rent uh, out. So there are problems with uh, making it generalizable and also putting it in the hands of politicians to announce things based on that without a, an understanding of what they all meant. Okay, so Jesse and Dan, uh, we wanna hear from you about the modification. We'll probably switch to uh, audience questions uh, thereafter. And this is a good opportunity for people signed on to the webinar to go to the chat box, uh, message everyone uh, with your questions, and then we'll pick, th pick through them for the uh, uh, group in Sydney to uh, address. So please, uh, Dan, Jesse, go ahead. You go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so we initially, as you said, it was all meant just for our um, hospital initially, apart from the airway uh, management cognitive aid that was released nationally. And that was meant to be something that was universally applicable about airway management in these patients in Australia. Um, and that's something that has been spread internationally through social media. With regards to modification requests, we got a few where we helped departments in Sydney um, for as their departmental specific and we helped design that for them. But we did also, if we move to the next slide, we had some um, hospitals request to integrate the cognitive aids into applications that they were developing. Um, you can see on the left of the screen there's um, one of our cognitive aids that's in the Emergency Medicine Kenya Foundation now. So that's um, the Safe Airway Society um, guideline, the cognitive aid that accompanies their guideline. Um, and then parts of the aids were taken out. You know, this is from a website in, in Vancouver where they've cut out part of one of our cognitive aids and put it up against their circle setup. So just go to the next slide. So one of our very talented colleagues, um, Dan Moy, helped develop this customization guide, which is a very simple, basic way that um, people can adapt the cognitive aids to their institution by basically just by cutting out and replacing, um, you know, key parts of, of the in information with what is more relevant to their department. I mean, obviously, we can't take responsibility for um, when people do that. As we, you know, set out, these were for our department, and we have quite a, you know, very strict way of ensuring that we have quality control over what is released to our department members and making sure that the latest version, which corresponds to the latest evidence, is up there. This has been developed as a goodwill um, for other departments to be able to modify but obviously once that happens we can't you know take um we can no longer maintain that quality control Un uh, under understood are you uh, uh archiving or collecting the things that people do change using this gu guide or the tools you've provided we we do ask them to to send us a copy, and I mean we're also interested for you know for ourselves, um, you know as part of a sort of our own um, learning, and, and I guess a, you know a part of the, the quality control um, uh, sort of processes is is to have is, is yeah essentially to keep a tab on this so that we know what's what's being put out elsewhere. Ultimately, we we don't have very much say over what people can do. I mean the the, the customization option is not the most flexible one that's out there, but there are ways to, you know, totally omit a various step. For example, if you're looking at, you know, you could probably just see a tiny glimpse of the excavation 
uh, cognitive aid there, and we've, we've got others uh, which which look similarly. Um, you know that they can sort of one can sort of um, leap between uh, various stages whilst omitting in individual steps. Um, but it, you know, I, this is I, I would not say this is the ideal or the optimal solution. Um, we have experimented with with different things in the past, uh, and this is sort of where we're currently at. But we're certainly open to um, to new ideas about uh, dissemination. Well, I think it's fair to say designing tools like this to make them foolproof is an often frustrating <laughs> and uh, monumentally challenging uh, goal to set for one oneself. Uh, I am not uh, at the moment seeing. Uh, oh, there, there we. Uh, uh, the question: Have you had to update or make immediate the? Uh, changes to the tools as you've been using in the in the field or through use cases uh, from your uh, cells. I think that's another way of uh, asking, have you uh, discovered critical flaws in the cognitive aids that required uh, immediate uh, remedy? Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, would We've had a couple of instances due to the speed of things coming out. Um, so if, if something was released and despite our due diligence, there was an error that was often picked up within you know minutes uh, of being released and then rectified. And we had a, quite a solid system of ensuring that all of the anaesthetic department had access to the most recent aid. Um, and we had a very strict version control to ensure that the most up-to-date policy was reflected on on the aid um, but but nevertheless I think to answer the question is yes and and, and the, the pressures the time pressures that COVID put on us all um, and to, together with all the other stresses going on in, in our individual lives during this crazy time I think uh, were no doubt um, influential in that um, we there's I mean I can think of one occasion where we had um, the, one of the units for the dosing um, of a particular drug. Um, I think we had put milligrams, sort of micrograms accidentally. Um, and another, another a good example has been about the whole controversy as I just alluded to earlier with aerosol generating procedures and, and that uh, in, in the context of cardiac arrest and, um, and there being some uh, toing and froing around some of those <laughs> topics, which um, which literally meant, you know, um, sometimes hours after release of a cognitive aid, which had been sort of, I guess, in, under development for, for in some some time, in some cases, days to weeks. Um, there all of a sudden needed to be a sudden change, and you know, the the danger is is that we are doing things. I mean, we're big fans of paper based cognitive aids, uh, and one of the benefits of that is is I guess that 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 attempt to, um, it's just easier, I guess, to, to have that degree of control. But when these are being sent as PDFs to people's emails or when you're making them available to download on, on a website, uh, it really doesn't matter if the delay is hours. It's, it, you know, one can essentially get hold of something potentially erroneous pretty quickly. Um, nevertheless, we, we try to do our best to, to disseminate the message that they need to move to version 1.2, for example, um, for, the, for, the, for the latest. And, and then we'll go and replace the actual physical copies. Right, I was just uh, thinking about that because I think Ben alluded to the fact that they were pasted uh, around the uh, operating th uh, theaters in a relatively large uh, institution. So, I mean, this is the, exactly the kind of discussion that comes up when one debates <coughs> paper versus electronic uh, ver versions. You don't have the opportunity to paste them on the glass barrier uh, outside the COVID room, uh, but on the other hand, you can change them pretty much uh, in uh, instantly. Uh, but sounds it sounds as though you're trying to get the best of both wor uh, wor worlds. So uh, another qu question it says, uh, culture is so important to checklist uptake. You mentioned that the culture was on your side, but you, do you have immediate buy-in to these tools or was there 
pushback or I mean, uh, it sounded as though people in your place were so used to cognitive aids that they uh, uh, embraced them. Yeah, partly. I mean, I think there's obviously within a hundred and ethos, there's a big range. There are some that will not use these at all, but part of it was everyone was just screaming out for something to guide this change because people were so anxious about themselves getting COVID and taking it home to their families. So people wanted something. So there was an impetus there for them to, to utilize whatever was available. And this is what we were providing for them. So that was, that was part of the, the reason that there was a really good uptake and really good use of it. And for people that had never used these cognitive aids before, it was like the vortex moment for me. It was a, a light switch that went on and said, hey, these can actually be useful. So if anything, it's actually helped in our department get those other people over the line that had never used them before. Can you talk a little bit about uh, tra training? So we've talked about posting them and circulating uh, PDFs electro electronically. Was there training in their, in their use uh, and uh, an implementation strategy other than circulating them? Uh, circulating them? Yeah. yeah, so um, with regard to the airway management at our simulation centre, every anaesthetist in our department and trainee had to undertake um, simulated training in intubation and expiration of a, a patient with COVID-19. And during that simulation training, the cognitive aids were used to help um, get people familiar with the processes. Um, there was, you know, so during that process, everyone in the department was exposed to those that component. Um, with the cardiac arrest, the resuscitation group within our hospital uh, did hospital-wide training. You know, there was a video which accompanied the cognitive aid. Um, with regard to some of the other aids, the, the huddle document. A lot of the nursing staff, there was key sort of stakeholders that were involved in rolling out, you know, some from surgery, some from um, anaesthetics and some from nursing to ensure that this was being practiced in a real time or like prior to a case occurring. So there were, it wasn't just something dropping into your inbox. There were sort of more systematic uh, uh, attempts to make sure everyone was educated. And even, even with the non-COVID aids, there were, you know, unfortunately COVID sort of got cut in the way as we had started formulating those plans. But we had plans um, essentially to uh, uh, sort of a, almost, almost create a course, if you like, to accompany the, the neuro aids and integrate them. So it would be a sort of a, you know, a neuroanesthetic course um, where cognitive aids featured very centrally. Um, and we actually managed to, to get uh, most of the trainees through um, sort of registrar training um, in uh, managing various neuro crises using, using the cognitive aid. So I think training is, is absolutely key. It's almost impossible to expect someone to be looking at any cognitive aid and, and be able to, you know, rapidly um, assimilate all that information and, and aim for what you're aiming for as an end result without that degree of, of additional training. Uh, and what I'd say is with, with COVID, yeah, you know, we've, we've, we've come some way. Um, it's interesting now with, you know, the potential for rise again in, in, in our district, um, you know, we'll probably have to do that again. Uh, truer words uh, were, were never spoke about the implementation and uh, the, the training. And uh, Sarah's posted a question I'm going to adapt a, li a little bit. So it, I'm getting the impression that the use of cognitive aids uh, and the culture that embraces them is established within uh, your your department and the kind of the associated uh, areas uh, in the institution. Has the culture of recognizing the benefit of cognitive aids to safe and reliable care permeated beyond the walls of the operating theater at uh, Royal North Shore? Uh, how much momentum uh, has been developed around cognitive aids uh, generally uh, it, uh, at your place? Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, and it's something which uh, I'm not sure that I know the answer to 
needless to say, I think it's safe to say we things have probably improved from where they were. Um, and just given that um, some of us, given the given what COVID has done, um, or that the sort of I guess the demands and the requirements placed on non theatre based staff. Um, to familiarise themselves with COVID protocols and our foray into doing cognitive aids for non-theatre-based crises such as cardiac arrest. I think um, that sort of recognition of cognitive aid use is, is certainly increasing beyond the, the theatre complex. We have also released some videos to the company um, to, to address some of the crises and actually they we've always tried to feature teams in preparation using cognitive aids and those videos have gone out to some of the wider staff as well so um you know we'd like i think we we'd all like to see there being a greater receptiveness towards their use um it, it's not a straightforward answer as you as, as we've sort of discussed and as, as you've alluded to uh, i'm not sure that we know the full extent to which that's happening but i think we can I think we feel confident that that is that the trajectory is is heading that way. So it sounds though many people many people outside of the operating theater are being exposed to the use of cog uh, cognitive aids. I suppose one can hope that they take notice of the benefits. Go on, Jesse. Were you about to say something? Sorry. Oh, I just wanted to add that prior to COVID, sort of airway management has been a big part in our hospital where cognitive aids have been really promoted. And in our emergency department and in the intensive care unit, you know, the use of cognitive aids around the time of an emergency intubation um, has really become standard practice in our hospitals. So I think prior to COVID, that's one area where um, our hospital has been very successful about championing the use of um, cognitive aids to ensure that people who are less familiar with the process of emergency intubation carry out the procedure in a successful way. So in answer to Sarah's question, in, in our hospital, that is definitely one area where they're strongly used. And, you know, almost if you don't use it, you will be questioned. Uh, great. Let me um, uh, maybe sneak in one last question. Uh, a question David Whitaker is asking about uh, whether you recommend or have adopted a practice of double wrapping emergency drugs so if they're not used they can be recycled for other cases. Uh, I think I can answer that. We we looked at we looked at those sort of things about uh, intubation trays and emergency drugs and, and taking them in and out of our theatre. From a theatre point of view we've we're very lucky in the physical space that we've got of having an ante room in the theatre. So we only have to keep the emergency drugs in the ante room. So in theory, they're always clean. Um, so we don't have to double wrap them. I know up in intensive care, they're double, they are double wrapping them to take them in, to have them in the physical room with them while they're, while they're intubating these COVID patients. Um, well, then they actually just unwrap it, wipe it down, and, and that's considered clean that can be used for the, for the next patient. Very, very good. Well, this time has certainly flo uh, flown by. You've been uh, terrific presenters and responders, and uh, we're uh, grateful to have had your time and for the contribution you've made to the care of COVID patients world worldwide. So on behalf of uh, EMIC and uh, Ariane and other uh, cognitive, cognitive aid uh, proponents, uh, uh, thank you. This has been a real, a real treat. Uh, I'll remind uh, those on the line that we will uh, hopefully by the end of the week be posting a recorded version of this webinar to emergencymanuals.org, uh, the archive section there. And um, uh, please feel free to refer your colleagues to it. Uh, Kurt, do you have any closing?